Let's talk about Rishi Sunak's speech first. That was the sort of grand finale of conference. And there were a few announcements in there. Um, HS2, of course, something that was uh, leaked or briefed uh, or, or, you know, accidentally dominated the entirety of conference. That was probably the announcement that people were waiting for to scrap the Manchester leg of that high-speed rail project. It's been really controversial. You've had so many uh, major figures coming out against it. David Cameron, Boris Johnson, George Osborne, and of course, Andy Street, the West Midlands mayor. Um, And so that came across as causing a lot of internal party division just from watching it from the outside as I was. Um, But there are a few other announcements in there as well. So Rachel, what stood out for you in terms of the other announcements from Rishi Sunak's speech? The one that kind of dominated and which is 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 the most interesting is the HS2 announcement because the the Prime Minister is scrapping the the high speed line from Birmingham to Manchester, but the sort of quid pro quo the compromise in that is um, that he spends the you know thirty billion plus on a lot of other smaller transport projects across the north called called Network North. Um, I think that allows him to campaign in various um, target constituencies. You know, um, Gedling, for example, has is, 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 um, had a promise of a, of a metro line to into the into the area. Um, the A1 is, is, is kind of there's another promise again for the road to be dualed. So it gives him something more specific to say in various constituencies. And I think it helps um, the Conservative Party leader to campaign on the idea that their, 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 their party is always the most responsible on the economy. And it's, a, and it's a trap for Labour in some sense because it forces them into a space where they may have to make a spending announcement or look like they're following the Conservative Party. So that is the headline story and it is the most consequential. But um, the one uh, announcement that I thought was really interesting and could actually be the Prime Minister's legacy was to um, ban, ban smoking and raise the age at which it we would ban smoking every year. Mm. Basically, someone who's, you know, 14 now will never be able to legally buy cigarettes. And I think that's um, a policy which will really annoy some Conservative backbenchers. So he looks like he's going to be kind of taking on some people within his party. He probably hopes that makes him look a little bit more like a strong leader. But it's also something that will will command widespread support. And you could argue is very good policymaking because as he kind of pointed out in his speech, there is no safe level of smoking. Yeah, I mean, it would be um, a major intervention. And for, on Labour's part, I mean, that's sort of semi their policy, isn't it? So they will be supporting it when he puts it to the Commons. Yeah, uh, Wes Streeting announced that, well, didn't announce that he was necessarily going to do it, but suggested it in an interview mm. in January. So if, if it came down to relying on Labour votes, if they do in fact need legislation for it, um, I imagine Mishi Sunak would be able to get it through. We also had a reiteration of something that we thought was coming down the line, uh, this introduction of the Advanced British Standard, which would be a new exam system to replace A-levels and T-levels. Um, and of course, this involves you know teaching maths to 18, which is something that Rishi Sunak has announced before. Zoe, how significant is this part of his kind of policy platform that he was announcing in his speech? Well, I think it's very kind of typical of some of the things we've seen from Sunak so far. So quite a lot of his offering for his vision of the future is kind of having this more skilled population that's um, able to, you know, to take on careers in tech and innovation. And part of that is having a population that learns maths uh, to the age of 18. So we've seen this trail before. Hmm. Um, I think it's, yeah, as I say, it's quite in keeping with, with I think, what people think of Sunak and the sort of leader he is. What I think is quite significant, though, is that apart from the scrapping of A-levels and the introducing of a new post-16 qualification and the the smoking ban, there was really nothing for young people in that speech at all. Mm. And for a prime minister that's trying to set out his vision of the future, it's quite extraordinary that things like planning reform, housing, um, the environment, you know, none of these things were properly touched on. And we've seen quite a lot of rolling back of, of net zero. But, it, you know, he, he talked about wanting to be the candidate for, for change, which is sort of quite paradoxical considering the Conservatives have been in power for 13 years. Um, And yeah, he doesn't actually present any kind of long-term vision for the future. I mean, it was a really quite weak conference speech. And that's aside from all the sort of horrible kind of culture war stuff that's been playing out. We saw lots of 
Um, we, you know, we saw him talk about trans people in quite a dehumanizing way. And again, all of that seems to fit in with this kind of generational culture war that the conservative right have been waging, which mm. Sunak lent into quite a lot there. So, yeah, I mean, I think it is it's quite surprising that there was so little for the younger generation in there. And, and the things he did announce seem to be, I don't know, I guess for some young people might seem a little bit of a a kick um, because it was just kind of more things you might have to do and won't be able to do rather than things that actually might make your you know your life in the next 10 20 30 years better off yeah that's a really interesting point well spotted and actually you touched on something i really wanted to talk about which was the wider framing of this speech this idea <laughs> this kind of wacky idea that he could somehow be a change candidate he was saying that he wanted to reverse 30 years of status quo broken politics. And I thought 30 was quite an interesting number. I think it's the first round number that sort of stretches far back enough to kind of just after Thatcher. <laughs> so it's probably why he chose it. But it did sound suspiciously like 13 on, on BBC <laughs> News when I was watching the highlights of the speech. And I suppose that's not very helpful to him. But he seems to have picked up on this thing that Keir Starmer has been running with for a while, which is the country has an appetite for change. Um, and doing things differently. And, you know, long-term decisions is part of the conference slogan. And that's something Keir Starmer has been sort of pushing for for a while with his end to sticking plaster politics and short-term solutions. Clearly, you know, they're both hearing the same things from the public, just Rishi Sunak was a little bit slow on the uptake. Um, I remember speaking to a pollster recently and their analysis was that the biggest mistake Rishi Sunak has made is not to distance himself with Boris Johnson and condemn the behaviour in Downing Street when that Privileges Committee reported and that was his opportunity and he lost the opportunity and you could see the sort of personal approval ratings changing since that point. Um, that could have been a moment perhaps to try and frame himself as a change candidate, which may have had a little bit more legitimacy. Um, what did you think of this longer term decisions or long term decisions for a brighter future motto, Rachel? It's a bloody mouthful for a start. It's not it's not it's not it's not a, a snappy bugging to take into an election necessarily. Well, nor was long term um, economic thought, plan, but that works for David Cameron back in 2015. That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, I, I think I think some of the things he's doing kind of run very, very counter to it. Right. You know. The HS2 decision was all about um, improving the North's economy mm. over decades and not just, you know, for the next five years, not just for an election term. Um, mm. It was supposed to be a real game, game changer. And similarly, when he when he made his net zero announcements, when it, I mean, when he made that speech in Downing Street, it very much sounded like um, that was some that was going to be part of his conference speech. It was going to form, you know, part of the overall narrative which he's putting here, which seems to be you can't you've got to be able to allow families to save money and to get by now. Um, rather than thinking about how the country saves money in the longer term, that's kind of how it, it that's how it's coming off. Um, but it, it it all looks like short termism because it, it seems to me the net zero announcements where you kind of um, he's supposedly sticking up for, for for motorists. It kind of looks like he is um, targeting a very specific group in that it's older voters. Um, you know, people who might be asset rich and cash poor. So um, it will cost, you know, the, their car feels like it's one of the biggest costs. And mm. I think he's very right to point out that a lot of the policies that British Sunak has put forward over the last week or so do feel like they're aimed at older generations. You know, the core, it feels all feels like a core vote strategy rather than thinking about how you improve lives for the future generations to come and how you actually do take those genuinely longer term decisions. And what I thought from watching the speech um, from, you know, just just on TV, so I didn't get the atmosphere in the hall like you two did, but there were some parts of it that I thought worked well, particularly when he was talking about his own personal story. And obviously we have heard things about his background before because he's run in the Conservative Party leadership contest and talked about his backstory. But this was his first conference speech as Prime Minister and spoke about his family background. Um, and most interestingly to me, he called Britain the most successful multi-ethnic democracy on earth. I think it's always, um, you know, quite a good angle for politicians of ethnic minority backgrounds to take to talk in such positive terms about, you know, what the UK has given their families and, you know, where they'd be if it wasn't for, for the UK and how, how it sort of welcomed them in now. That's something that you've seen from 
you know, Sadiq Khan to Sajid Javid. You know, it's 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 a well trodden route, but it's it tends to it tends to go down well. Um, but what was interesting about him taking this angle was that it directly jarred with what we'd heard from Suella Braverman uh, in her speech to that American think tank, which we spoke about on a previous episode of the podcast, um, where she was suggesting that um, multiculturalism was something that had been um, a failure in Europe. Um, how do you square those two sort of outlooks, Zoe? Well, I don't know if you you can really. I mean, it, I do think I do think you're right that that bit worked quite well, but I do think that um, immigration has defined so much of Sunak's premiership. These conversations and this kind of ramping up of of anti-immigrant rhetoric. Um, and just previously, the day before, you know, the Home Secretary had done another quite um, extraordinary speech um, where she talked about, you know, immigration as this hurricane that was coming. Mm. And that's all very, you know, present in people's minds. Obviously, you're going to have a, a raft of uh, people there in the conference hall who are supportive of Sunak, who are supportive of Braverman. You know, this was the Conservative Party conference. But the, for the public who are watching that, um, and for many of them who'll be concerned by Braverman's comments, I think Sunak's speech won't won't possibly impact them in the way he might have intended because it's still so soon after Braverman's been making these kind of comments. Um, we know that Sunak's cabinet is quite diverse. You know, the Energy Secretary, we've got mm-hmm. the Home Secretary as well, um, and obviously Sunak himself. And you know, that's absolutely that's great for representation in the UK. But when you have a government that's actively kind of putting forward these policies that are quite harmful um, to a number of immigrants, and when you've also got these policies that um, are kind of ramped and shrouded in this in this quite problematic rhetoric, I don't think it has the same effect on the rest of the general public as it might do on those sort of immediately within the hall who are supporting him. Mm. I, I think there's actually a broader problem that's that could be more interesting over the long term, as in the way the Conservatives speak about um, immigration policy is always quite divisive. And I wonder if, you know, the, the hurricane language, the, you know, the mere, the, the immigration we've seen is a mere gust compared to what we're, we're going to see, that it is quite dehumanising. But I also think that that could undermine their credibility on the policy longer term, because it just, I think it gives the overall impression that you're desperately trying to look tough or you're trying to draw dividing lines rather than trying to do something that is that is a genuine solution. So I wonder if it might come to come back to bite them slightly that the the rhetoric's obviously not matching up with with their handling of the small boats crisis, which voters see get worse all of the time. Zoe, what did you make of her speech? So her speech, I think, was um, pretty in keeping with quite a lot of the things we've heard from Brotherman over the especially over the last month or so. Um, obviously, we referred to her speech uh, that she did last week when mm. she was in the US, um, where she was kind of setting out a bit of a case for the UK to maybe consider leaving the European Convention on Human Rights when she talked about wanting to get a hand on immigration, when she basically did a lot of blaming international institutions for the immigration crisis rather than national kind of policy failures. Um and we saw a bit more of that here. So we definitely saw her ramping up the rhetoric again, obviously the comments about the hurricane. She also spoke about, um, you know, other issues um, within her brief. She talked about, she used this strange phrase, luxury beliefs. The luxury beliefs brigade sit in their ivory towers telling ordinary people that they are morally deficient because they dare to get upset about the impact of illegal migration, net zero or habitual criminals. So she was doing what she's done before with the sort of, I think she was the person who used to condemn the tofu munching Guardian reading Wokarati, but she was, she was you know, <laughs> continuing on that theme in this by suggesting that it's only people who have everything in life and are very comfortable from their ivory towers who can feel sympathetic to migrants and, you know, believe in rehabilitative justice and things like that, um, which to me, I thought sounded very patronising. And kind of removed from the real world, ironically, she felt like like the one who was in the ivory tower. Because I go and report from a lot of food banks and a lot of um, community projects where people are trying to respond to the cost of living crisis and, you know, make life easier for people who are the most vulnerable in society. The people running these places are not the sort of (laughs) bourgeois metropolitan academics or whoever she was having a go at. They're people who were embedded in their communities. They're, They're people who would describe themselves as working class people. So I did think that that really jarred with reality to me. I kind of got what she was driving at in terms of that, you know, the same old populist, let's have a go at the metropolitan elite type rhetoric, but it just didn't ring true to me. 
Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point because I've, I've been surprised this year by how many friends have got in touch with me while knowing that I was at Conservative Party conference and said, how out of touch are these people? Like, I mean, I mean, this does not match with what I'm seeing. And this year it looks, you know, even more off the wall than some of their other conferences. Um, you know, Boris Johnson's in 2019 is one that which stands out. I think it, this was a speech that was, it, it, it was probably in terms of its delivery and its oratory, like the most impressive speech though. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was very clearly um, a pitch for the leadership. But I think it makes her the front runner actually, because it was a very broad argument. It was obviously aimed at somebody who wants to be the leader of the opposition in future. She was asking the audience there to visualize her doing that job. Um, but, but it did feel like it wasn't addressing the the here and the now. That's I think you're right about that. And was she the sort of, I mean, did it go down well? Was I'm, I know that on the last podcast you spoke about the um, sort of Liz Truss effect and, and Nigel Farage and all of these other kind of going for growth type right wingers dominating the conference was she was she sort of the other darling of the conference did you did you get that impression I mean what was the atmosphere like around her the way she she pitched that speech but appeared to be and matched it with being incredibly loyal because you know there's always been this thing in the conservative party in particular that if you you know if you wield the knife you'll never wear the crown Mm. and that she obviously very much had that in mind which was was smart I thought from a you know purely political um, perspective, but um, I kind of think she really blew people away with that speech. You know, judging by what people said on the way out, you know, they were she obviously rehearsed it mm-hmm. to the end degree um, and came to conference wanting to make a huge impression. Um, and I think she did actually. I think um, I think she was successful in that. It's really interesting. And something else um, that came across just from sort of absorbing the conference from afar was how much kind of post-truthism was going on. So Claire Coutinho, the environment minister, kind of made up this policy that uh, that Labour's going to tax meat and sh- sort of that unraveled during the course of an interview where she was questioned repeatedly about it and clearly didn't have a leg to stand on. Mark Harper spoke about f- the idea of 15-minute cities being sinister and that councils would tell you, you know, when and when not to go to the shops. I mean, that's, you know, a, a well-established internet conspiracy theory are we at the stage where they are really just using and i know it's a bit of a cliche but you know the trumpian playbook in terms of just throwing stuff out there knowing that it doesn't have a basis in reality but hoping that it drives up some kind of base of voters that they want to turn out for them well you know it's interesting i almost got the impression that the conservatives at this conference were appealing to several different sort of parts of their voter base so Mm -hmm. i do think there was an appeal to some voters they think might actually believe this stuff so you know the 15 minute city stuff the the labor's coming for your meat and they're coming for your flights and they're giving you all these bins or you know that stuff <laughs> i think there is a core of people who who believe that and they're just trying to you know to 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 increase that belief but i you know i went to this um spectator event fringe event about net zero and uh, whether the the government should you know sort of help the public um change their behaviors and there was this comment about Labour um, wanting to tax me, and the sort of you know the the comments from the the panel of which had one government minister and one former government minister on was like, oh yeah, but you know Keir Starmer's a vegetarian, so that's that's like what we're getting at there. And there was this kind of laughter, like yeah, it's all a bit of a joke, really. Um, you know, it's all just it's all in good fun. He's obviously just a vegetarian, that's why we're saying it. So even if there's an understanding that it is not true it's almost like it, there's a feeling that it's harmless to say so or in some way it communicates you know something about the opposition something jokey um and i think these kind of these things are getting conflated it's almost like well we have a sense of humor about this we can laugh at it but other voters might genuinely believe that you know the 15 minute city thing mm. um and it just seems like there's this kind of lack of understanding of the consequences of some of their words and the impact it might have on voters and people watching and following these policies um and yeah it just it does seem like you know integrity in that sense telling the truth about things and making sure the public understand really really well the nuances of policy has sort of just 
been left in the gutter at this conference and that actually it's more about sound bites it's about clicks and it's about getting you know pe uh, ministers faces out there or mps faces out there even if the things they're saying aren't true as long as they're provocative mm, ironic as sunak's whole mission seems to be wanting to do politics differently maybe this is what it means if you're you know the con the conservatives and you're looking at the poll numbers at the way they are you know the huge polling chasm there is with your competitor the the thing you would fear most is the Labour Party running away with the narrative, you know, dominating the news agenda, having days and days of their own stories on the on the front pages of newspapers. Um, so you want to cause um, something of an, of an explosion and you want to drag some of the um, reporting on into your space and to be talking about the questions that you, that you want asked. Um, so I think it's as simple as, as that, really. I think the, the Conservatives would probably worried about not being written about at all. I know, I know everyone saw in the, those first couple of days, all the reporters who were there taking pictures saying it feels like a wick, there's nobody in the hall. You know, organisers of the conference will have been oh, aware that that was coming down the track potentially. Mm. And I think that probably informs some of it. But I don't think um, everyone within the Conservative Party agrees with the kind of you know, amplifying of conspiracy theories. You know, I saw Penny Mordaunt speak speak about it at a Conservative Friends for Israel event, for example. She was talking about a different issue. She wasn't talking about her own party, but the coded message was, I'm not especially comfortable with what's happening here. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you so much, both of you, for taking us through how that conference went. Thanks so much for watching. We'd love to know what you think. Please make sure you leave your comments below. And if you enjoyed watching this podcast, you can watch more of our videos on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to like and subscribe.